Welcome to the Daily Dispatch. First, we'll take you to the East Asian Theater, where the talk of the town is security. China and Russia are conducting the joint military drills, while North Korea warned Japan of counteraction for their defense buildup. Next on the dispatch, we'll talk about the request of Palestinian Prime Minister to deploy the UN monitors in areas that are frequently attacked by Israel, and what this actually means. And lastly, the United Nations chief has warned of far-right and white supremacist threats in the West. We'll talk about the prevalence of extreme right tendencies and what that could mean. We're here to give you the news and to help you in further world around you. I'm Tayyab Anasar Khan, and here is your Daily Dispatch. China and Russia are all geared up to conduct the joint naval drills in the East China Sea this week. Now, defense cooperation between the two states has picked up pace since the conflict between Russia and Ukraine began in February. And this is one among the major series of joint exercises between the two states in the past months. Now, the East China Sea is contiguous with the Taiwanese as well as Japanese ports and has remained a contested area between China and Japan. China's rivalry with the United States also has a deep connection with tensions in the East China Sea, considering the U.S.'s support for the Taiwanese claim to the territorial waters. And with Chinese defense ally, North Korea, recently lambasting Japan for its military buildup. Further intrigue has been added to these exercises. This would be Japan's largest military buildup since the Second World War, with experts suggesting this buildup is being fueled by worsening ties with China rising hostility from North Korea and apprehensions of possible conflict spillover as a result of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. The US, South Korea and Japan in the previous week concluded a trilateral agreement to counter North Korea's nuclear threats and missile launches into the Japanese waters. Whether the time and place where these exercises were picked intentionally or if it's all circumstantial, it holds value in military signaling from Russia and China towards the Eastern and Western competitors while posturing to support the positions of allies in the region. Next, we'll take you to the Middle East, where Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammad Ashatieh has asked for deploying United Nations monitors in the West Bank. He called on the UN team stationed at Palestine to deploy the monitors in areas in the occupied West Bank, which frequently come under attack by the Israeli settlers. Now, this appeal comes at a time when violence by both Israeli army and the illegal settlers against the Palestinians in the occupied West Bank has seen an uptick. More than 160 Palestinians have been killed by the Israeli army in the occupied West Bank in 2022, when the United Nations figure says that Israeli settlers attacked 793 Palestinians and their properties. Now, Israel claims the presence of the Israeli Defense Forces in the West Bank are for security purposes. Violence has been a daily feature of the lives of Palestinians living in the West Bank since 1967, when Israel occupied it along with East Jerusalem and Gaza Strip in the 1967 war. Since then, Israel has settled more than half a million illegal Israeli settlers in the West Bank and controls more than 60% of its territory. Now, Israeli settlements are one of the fundamental impediments to a two-state solution under the United Nations Security Council Resolution 242 and are illegal under the international law. Systematic dispossession of the Palestinians, discriminatory laws, and continuous targeting by the Israeli authorities have made Amnesty International to call Israeli treatment of Palestinians as apartheid. With Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the longest-serving Prime Minister of Israel, having held the position of Prime Minister for 15 years, set to form a coalition government with the right-wing group, Palestinians fear that more and more Palestinians will be forcefully evicted from their homes and attacks against them will increase. And now let's talk about some rising trends and tendencies of extremism in the world. In a recent statement during his annual end-of-year conference, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, warned against the rising threat of white supremacy in the West. Guterres said right-wing tendencies, including the anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, neo-Nazism, white supremacy, and other such forms should be firmly condemned. A US-based organization, the Southern Poverty Law Center, in its annual report stated that they tracked 838 active hate groups in 2020 alone, including groups like the Oath Keepers, which is an American far-right anti-government militia, and also Proud Boys, 
which is a far-right pro-Western chauvinistic organization that has different chapters in the US, Canada, and even Israel. Hate groups remained over 800 during the Trump administration due to the populist white supremacist narrative of Make America Great Again. On January 6, riots at the Capitol Hill were allegedly incited by the former U.S. President, Donald Trump's provocative remarks that U.S. presidential election had been rigged. Besides the U.S., far-right narrative and groups are also increasing in Europe, including in France and Germany. For example, Marie Le Pen's National Rally, a far-right party with xenophobic rhetoric in France, has been able to garner significant support since 2017. Some of her party leaders are allegedly working with now-banned organization, the Generation Identity, which is an anti-immigrant organization working to protect the identity and culture of white Europeans. France recently shut down the Generation Identity to curb hatred and violence. Now in another example, Germany recently arrested 25 members of the Reich citizens in the suspected plot of the coup. Now the citizens of the Reich deny the existence of a post-World War II Federal Republic of Germany. And they aren't averse to using violence either, and also hold anti-Semitic sentiments. In 2022, German domestic intelligence agency estimated that 23,000 citizens of the Reich exist in Germany, with 5% of them being extreme far-rightists. With the rise of these extreme right-wing organizations, there are fears that political polarization in the West will intensify further and will lead to more insecurity for the religious minorities and the immigrants. For our next dispatch, is it too late to apologize? On Monday, the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte formally apologized on behalf of the Dutch state for its historical role in slavery. Today, I apologize. Root said, acknowledging that the consequences of the Dutch state's actions continue to this day. Through its colonial past, the Dutch state shipped more than half a million African slaves, mostly to the former colony of Suriname, and the country profited greatly from such practices in the 17th and 18th centuries, with slavery only being banned in its territories in 1863. Now, the Prime Minister's televised speech was delivered at The Hague, and comes against the backdrop of the country grappling with its colonial past, as well as considerations to return the looted art to its former colonies, and its current struggles with racism as well. Now, the apology has also been accompanied by the setting up of 200 million euro fund to increase the awareness and involvement and follow-up regarding the country's role in slavery. Similarly, the Dutch state also proposed the establishment of an independent remembrance committee, However, it is also important to note that the apology drew criticism from many in the country and beyond, with the Surinamese people who are the descendants of slaves labeling the apology insincere and merely ceremonial, citing the lack of the reparations, the government's failure to include rights groups and the descendants of the slaves in the conversation, as well as refusing to coordinate with the Surinamese groups for the timing and location of the apology. With this development, the Netherlands joined the ranks of countries like Denmark and Belgium, who've recently apologized for their role in colonization and slavery. But much scrutiny and grievances remain, with large parts of the developing world in Africa and Asia still suffering from the lasting effects of the European nation's colonial histories. Now let's talk climate. The coming Montreal Biodiversity Framework was agreed upon by almost 200 countries recently at the 2022 United Nations Biodiversity Conference. Jointly organized by the governments of China and Canada in Montreal, this deal aims to reverse the decades of environmental destruction threatening the world's species and ecosystems. Now, the primary features of the deal are maintaining, enhancing, and restoring the ecosystems, sustainable use of biodiversity, safeguarding the provisions of food, clean water, etc., ensuring the benefits of the natural resources are shared equally while protecting the rights of indigenous people, and pooling the resources into biodiversity. The Kunming Montreal deal directs the countries, using their public and private resources, to allocate $200 billion per year for biodiversity initiatives by 2030. The funds will be utilized to protect 30% of the world's land and water ecosystems by 2030, and eventually end at least $500 billion worth of harmful subsidies. And despite the framework not being legally binding, countries will be required to show their annual progress on the designated targets. Overall, the deal has received a mixed set of reactions. While some claim it to be a historical moment, 
and compare it with the Paris Climate Deal signed in 2015 to keep the rise in world temperature below 2 degrees Celsius. Other countries from the global south have raised concerns and demanded more financial contributions from the developed world. And lastly, we'll take you back to China's domestic situation, where hospitals in China have been coming under severe strain due to the rising cases of COVID-19, resulting in a rising number of health workers, such as doctors and nurses, also being affected. Now, the Chinese authorities have directed the health workers with moderate symptoms to continue working. And in order to mitigate the shortage of the hospital beds, health officials have asked people with mild symptoms to quarantine at home. Now, the Chinese health officials have stated that most cases are asymptomatic. However, with 40% of China's elderly population not having received a booster shot, the World Health Organization has said that vaccinating them would be critical in the coming months. Now, China's public health officials say that possibly 800 million people could be infected with the coronavirus over the next few months. Health experts from the country and outside have also expressed concerns that the recent loosening up of the restrictions can be deadly, with some Western outlets reporting it can cause up to 1 million deaths in the next year. Now, due to abrupt changes in COVID-related restrictions and rising COVID cases, the World Bank has revised China's earlier growth outlook for the year 2023. From the previous projection of 4.5%, the new projection has been scaled back to 4.3%. Also, unlike China's official growth output of 5.5% for 2022, the Washington-based lender has reconfigured its forecast to 2.7%. That's all, folks. We'd be happy to receive your suggestions and feedback. We'll be back tomorrow with more bite-sized news that keeps you up to date with what's going on in the country, the region, and the globe. I'm Tayyab Anasar Khan, and this was your Daily Dispatch.